mirror a poem. What I remember most from that first dive, about 900 dives ago, is the brain coral, 60 feet underwater, lobed like my brain. Fish shimmied past elephant ear coral, bright orange oracles, and tube sponges, clusters of purple arms reaching. But I kept returning to the coral that mimicked my brain. In my thrill, I used up my air in half the time. After that, Everything started to show up in everything else. The hermit crab shell in Romanesco broccoli. In the delta, a lightning bolt. Bony hands in a winter tree. Down at 60 feet, I peered through a mask at this alien and familiar world. I wanted to stay where my brain had its own life, surrounded by sun shimmer. I wanted to stay where the human clamor was replaced by the crunch of parrotfish beaks eating coral, once digested and excreted, the way fine white sand gets made. Besides being a poet and relationship alchemist, I'm also an, an avid diver and underwater photographer. From my very first dive 21 years ago, I fell in love with the beauty and uniqueness of sea life. These are clownfish that I photographed in Indonesia, also known as Nemo. Clownfish live on the same anemone their whole life. They have a symbiotic relationship with the anemone and are immune to its sting, finding safety among its protective tentacles. While the anemone provides the clownfish protection and shelter, the clownfish also protect and nourish the anemone by fending off predator fish and providing food in the form of nitrogen in their waste. Clownfish society is very structured, but unlike human society, the dominant largest member of the family is female. And the next largest is the reproductive male, her mate. The rest of the clownfish on the same anemone are all smaller males without reproductive organs. When the female dies, her mate grows larger and turns female, taking over the top role. And one of the smaller males develops reproductive organs and grows larger to become her mate. So even though all clownfish are born male and unable to breed, every single one of them has the capacity to become the reproductive male and the female should the need arise. Isn't that amazing? What I've learned in my years of being an underwater visitor is that sea life has a lot to teach us about gender fluidity and evolution's ingenuity. In the ocean, gender is fluid in various kinds of fish, mollusks, and crustaceans. The ones that switch from male to female are called protandrous hermaphrodites. The ones that switch from female to male are called protogynous hermaphrodites. And the ones that retain the capacity to reproduce as both male and female are called simultaneous hermaphrodites. We originated in the ocean and without and evolved to live on land without the biological capacity to alter our gender. But couldn't we evolve again to become less rigid around our definitions of gender identity and gender-based roles? Today's world is asking us to reassess our relationship to traditional roles and gender. In 2016, 17% of all stay-at-home parents were dads, up from 10% in 1989, according to the Pew Research Center. And 24% of those dads reported that they made this choice primarily to take care of the family, instead of staying home because they couldn't find work or were ill or disabled. During that same time frame, the percentage of women staying home to take care of the family dropped from 86% to 78%. These past 18 months have impacted women, and especially mothers, the hardest of anyone. These rapidly changing economic and social conditions are an invitation to all of us to learn how to creatively respond to new pressures. For far too long, We've had rigid archetypes that we've expected men and women to fit into, and we've shamed and mistrusted those who didn't fit neatly into those archetypes. 
letting go of rigid ideas around gender-based roles and allowing people to choose roles based on temperament and zones of genius would enable us to create a world that honors both our individuality and our interdependence. This would also enable us to meet one another as whole people from the inside out, where instead of trying to stuff one another into rigid archetypes, we could actually connect with one another out of the truth of who we are. To anyone who says it's unnatural for men to stay home and raise their kids, I say, look at the ocean. I also say look at the ocean to those who say it's unnatural to change the gender you were assigned at birth. As we've already seen, clownfish are protandrous hermaphrodites. They change from male to female when necessary. Parrotfish are protogynous hermaphrodites. They live in harems of females with a dominant male. And when he dies, one of the females turns male and takes over the harem. This is a male Napoleon wrasse in Palau with a lot of personality. <laughs> Rasses are also protogynous hermaphrodites. Except what's different about wrasses is that they, the females, some of them become male, and some of the males are born male. Nudibranchs are simultaneous hermaphrodites. Here's a pair I photographed in Indonesia simultaneously fertilizing one another with the two coiling penises you can see passing through the touching tubes. And here's another nudibranch leaving behind its beautiful white spiral of eggs. Yellow-headed jawfish males brood fertilized eggs in their mouths until they hatch. They aerate them often by spitting out the clump of eggs and sucking it back in again. I lay in the sand perfectly still at 30 feet down in Turks and Caicos for almost two hours to get this shot because they're very shy and it takes a long time for them to get comfortable enough with a diver's presence to emerge out of their hole in the sand and begin aerating the eggs again. This is a pygmy seahorse in Palau, about the size of my pinky nail. You may know that female seahorses impregnate the males who gestate the eggs and give birth to live seahorse babies. But what you may not know is that she re-impregnates him about a half hour later, before the stretch marks are even gone. <laughs> These are all examples of nature responding creatively and successfully to pressure. It's the pressure that moves us to evolve out of our origins. Becoming more fluid around gender in response to current pressures is key to our full expression as human beings. And it's also key to evolving a world that works for everyone. Once we learn to respond to change by becoming curious instead of rigid and supporting each of us in being who we are, regardless of our limited archetypes, we can better serve our loved ones and the world. After six years together, my partner is coming to love and respect the ocean like I do, regularly texting me TikTok videos of weird and fun facts about sea life. And I'm becoming intimately familiar with the Marvel Universe. <laughs> I'm a cisgendered woman in relationship with a cisgendered man, meaning our gender identities match the sex we were each assigned at birth. But we still have a non-traditional relationship. I'm over a decade older than him. We come from different racial and class backgrounds, and I'm the primary breadwinner. We cross so many boundaries of difference to be together, and yet, we simply fit. This kind of boundary crossing to expand true love and connection is essential to the future of our species. It's no accident that more people are finding their voice now to express that they don't identify as the gender they were assigned at birth. It's cisgendered people's responsibility to welcome and hear these voices instead of ignoring or shaming them. We can learn from nature how to be more fluid 
instead of staying stuck in our current gender constructs, believing that we have it all figured out and behaving like we're separate from nature. Because we don't. And we're not. Encouraging people to discern their right roles and they authentically express their gender identities in a way that's true to who they are, would it go a long way toward creating peace with one another and harmony with the natural world? Nature isn't judgmental. It is what it is. We can learn from nature. Just look at the ocean. Thank you. <laughs>